during this uh, summer school, we have already seen many examples of zeta functions. And in particular, uh, we saw in lectures of professors Boscherer and Panchishkin how we can associate the standard L function to functions invariant by the action of different groups. Uh, during this talk, I would like to tell you uh, how one can associate also standard L function to functions that are invariant by the Jacobi group. And hence, they are called uh, Jacobi forms. Actually, during this talk, you will also see uh, many not notions that have been already introduced by uh, Professor Boscher. So you, can, you will find here many examples of the objects that you are probably a little bit familiar with now, uh, but in the setting when the group G uh, is a Jacobi group. And before I start, I should say uh, that all the results that will be presented here uh, are the effect of joint work with Tonasis Buganis uh, from Durham University. So I would like to start by giving you an overview of the doubling method. It will be discussed in more detail in the last lecture of Professor Boscherer, uh, but since it comprises uh, really the basis for the results that I'm going to uh, show you, I should give you at least the taste of how it looks like. Uh, this is a very powerful method to construct uh, L functions. So the method uh, goes back to Piatecki, Shapiro, and Rallis, and this, I think, is as follows. Uh, so we start with an algebraic group H and two groups G1 and G2, so that, such that it is possible uh, to embed the product of G1 and G2 uh, into H. Uh, P will denote a parabolic subgroup, uh, F will be a global field. And we consider an Eisenstein uh, series. This series is defined on a group H with adelic entries. So perhaps you remember that whenever we talk about uh, modular forms, uh, one can view them as functions defined on upper half complex plane, generalized half complex plane uh, with the action of the group. But then it is also possible to view them as functions on the group with adelic entries. And then it turns out that they are automorphic forms. So the Einstein series is defined on a group uh, H. The summation goes over uh, H over entries in F, modulo parabolic subgroup, just so that it converges. Um, we also consider a uh, cuspidal automorphic forms, F1 and F2, on the groups G1 and G2, respectively. So as you probably remember, uh, on the space of modular forms or automorphic forms, uh, we can define an inner product. Uh, this inner product uh, is given by the following formula. So here we will uh, integrate an Eisenstein series against a cusp form. But because this Eisenstein series is defined on a group H to which we can embed a product of G1 and G2, let's see what will happen if we restrict this inner product uh, just to the product of G1 and G2. So then the argument of an Eisenstein series is just a block diagonal matrix yes, coming from this restriction. But then the cuspidal form F that we had before, that was defined on a group, bigger group H, may be now viewed as really a product of two cuspidal forms, one on group G1 and another one on G2. And so when we write down how this inner product looks like, uh, we obtain an integral uh, which, define, uh, which defines rankin selberg type L function. Why this is an L function? Um, it will be clear a bit later, but one of uh, the properties of this L function is that it is expected to have an Euler product. Namely, if we would plug in to this expression defining the L function, the formula for an Eisenstein series, uh, what we get is a summation uh, over H modulo P, of course. But then, because our integral was invariant under G1 cross G2, 
over f, then we can really mod this out by g1 cross g2 over f. Uh, so the contribution of gamma that was in this g1 cross g2 may be taken into the variables g1 and g2. So then we make some kind of change of variables. And so because of this, uh, now the functions, the arguments of functions f1 and f2 do depend uh, on the coset representatives gamma uh, that we chose. Now, uh, really the difficult part when dealing with this kind of L function is to find out how this coset decomposition uh, looks like. But every, if everything goes well, uh, the n gamma over which we integrate this inner integral, uh, which can be actually written as a product of two integrals, yes? One containing f1, another f2. So if all goes well, uh, then this n gamma will contain a unipotent radical of a parabolic subgroup of g1 cross g2 for all but one representative's gamma. And this means basically, uh, just because our f1 and f2 are cuspidal, that by the definition, one of this integral will vanish at these gammas. So eventually, if all goes well, uh, we will be left with just one integral coming from one representative uh, gamma. And then making uh, another change of variables, we will arrive at the integral that I showed at the beginning. So phi now, it can be just defined over group uh, G1, say. And then we also have an inner product uh, of F1 and F2. Uh, the thing is that now, uh, on the function f1, we could have the action of a group g1. So now, uh, the advantage of doing this uh, over uh, the Adels is that uh, we can write down this inner product in a unique way uh, as a product of local factors. And the same we can do for phi. So actually, and so at the end, we can define the local factors in such a way that in a sense for free, we get an Euler product for this integral. So this is the general idea. But then why this is useful? Uh, so we complete, computed, an, uh, say we computed an inner product of Eisenstein series against two cast forms. And uh, this is an L function, and it possesses uh, an Euler product. But now, if you look at this expression, you will see that analytic properties of the L function uh, do depend, really, on the analytic properties of the Eisenstein series. So then, if we are able to show that Eisenstein series has meromorphic continuation, uh, if we have some information about its poles, then we can carry this information over to the L function just because we have this equality. Actually, originally, uh, this method was applied by Peter Tetsky, Shapiro, and Rallis in the case when groups G1 and G2 were equal to a certain reductive group, uh, for example, symplectic, orthogonal, uh, unitary. And as you remember, whenever we speak of modular forms uh, or also automorphic forms, one can associate with them an automorphic representation. So if basically, if F1 would be associated to some representation pi 1, then it is actually necessary that the other cuspidal form against which we integrate has to be in the vector space of the associated representation, which is called contra-gradient representation. This is because otherwise the inner product uh, that we saw when we were evaluating this, kind of evaluating this integral, uh, would be zero. So this is a necessary assumption. Uh, however, when you see this, uh, you may now wonder, why am I writing all this in such generality? Why am I introducing two groups, G1 and G2? 
because it seems that if we take different groups, uh, then there is basically no chance that our L function uh, will be non-zero. Well, we can slightly kind of relax this method. Uh, what would happen if instead of integrating against two cusp forms, we would just take an inner product of the Eisenstein series against the cusp form that lives, say, on a group uh, G1? And uh, this idea uh, goes back to Garrett and then was used uh, by many people. I'm going to tell you how this looks like when it is applied uh, to Jacobi groups and Jacobi forms. So we are going to embed two groups, uh, two Jacobi groups, possibly of different sizes, to a bigger Jacobi group. And we will integrate against the Jacobi form. And then hopefully, we will get an L function. Uh, but now I should tell you finally uh, what Jacobi forms are. Well, they are very similar uh, to, mo to modular forms that you have already seen. Uh, they are defined on a slightly extended Ziegel upper half plane. They are invariant under the action of Jacobi group uh, or its congruence subgroups, perhaps uh, up to certain uh, character. So the, uh, the HN you have already seen. This is a Ziegel upper half plane. Uh, GN is a Jacobi group, which I'm going to define in a moment. Chi is a character. And this group G acts on the space of these holomorphic functions uh, in a very similar way, in a sense, uh, as to symplectic group acts on the space of modular forms. The action is just slightly more complicated. So we have the automorphy factor. And you can recognize the part that you already know from the case of modular forms, the determinant of c tau plus uh, d, yes, to the minus k. So k is the weight of a Jacobi form. By the way, you see here that I'm considering scalar valued case, yes? So one could also talk about uh, vector valued Jacobi forms, but then this is more complicated. And actually, the results are only for scalar varied k. So sorry for that. Uh, but when you will look how this action of a Jacobi group looks like on a Jacobi forms, you will see that there are two parameters. There is a weight, which you have already seen, but there is also this matrix M. This is a half integral symmetric uh, matrix of a size that you choose, basically. And this matrix is called an index of a Jacobi form. So let's see now uh, how the Jacobi groups look like. Uh, its definition is uh, a bit strange and complicated. And you don't really want to look at this, uh, because the elements of Jacobi groups are triples or set of certain matrices. And this, is mu this triple uh, is multiplied uh, by a, an element of a symplectic group. However, if you don't like this exposition, you can also view the elements of a Jacobi group as elements of symplectic group. Uh, and so via this embedding, they are va there are various ways, by the way, to embed a Jacobi group into symplectic matrices. But via this embedding, you can recover the group law on Jacobi, uh, on Jacobi group from multiplication of symplectic matrices. And uh, in a similar way, uh, symplectic matrices act on Ziegler upper half complex plane uh, via fractional linear transformation, where, of course, these A, B, C, D are now uh, matrices. Uh, then also GN, Jacobi groups, acts on the domain of Jacobi forms. And the action can be, again, derived uh, from this embedding of a Jacobi group into symplectic matrix. Uh, I just wanted to show you how it looks like. You don't really have to remember it. Uh, the important part is uh, that when we, 
look at what happens at the, at the so-called symplectic variable, uh, the variable that lives on Ziegler upper half plane. Here we have just an action of a symplectic matrix, a symplectic part of G. So this is really the same as uh, in the case of Siegel modular forms, but then of course we have this extra, uh, extra part. But then when you see this Jacobi group, uh, you may wonder why would anybody study such an object and how people could come up with the definition of Jacobi group and Jacobi forms and why they are useful at all. Uh, well, the reason is uh, that they are very closely related uh, to Siegel modular forms, as we have kind of seen a little bit. So just to remind you, Siegel modular forms are holomorphic functions on upper half complex, generalized half complex plane, uh, invariant under the action of symplectic matrices, and the action is as follows. So these properties already, uh, you know that holomorphicity and invariant by the action of a group uh, imply immediately that F has Fourier expansion. This Fourier expansion is of the following form. It's over symmetric, semi-positive uh, definite matrices that are half integral. So integers are allowed only on the diagonal. Uh, but these matrices uh, can be written, out, written down more explicitly. So this is the moment where you choose uh, the index, say, of your uh, Jacobi form. You choose some uh, natural number L that is smaller than L plus N. And you say, you divide the argument Z so that tau prime that occurs there is an L by L matrix. So it lives on HL. And everything else is adjusted. And also this matrix M is of size L times L. So now when you plug in uh, these uh, matrices Z and T to Fourier expansion, what you will get is a formula like this. So now, as you can see, I extracted uh, the part uh, which contains the variable tau prime that I chose at the beginning. And everything else that stays in the middle is just a function that depends on uh, the variables tau and w. And actually, this function that is inside, which obviously depends on the matrix M, turns out to be a Jacobi form. It's actually a Jacobi form of the same weight after the modular form we started with uh, here in the here of level gn over integers and of index m. So Jacobi forms, uh, since they occur in Fourier expansion of Siegel modular forms, this expansion is called uh, Fourier Jacobi expansion, they may be used uh, to study uh, Siegel modular forms. And this is one of the reasons why they are interesting. But before I go further, actually, so so far, uh, I really focused on the functions that are invariant under the full group. And these were also really maybe the main objects of the lecture of Professor Boscherer. But really, in this talk, I will be interested in Jacobi forms that are invariant by a certain congruence subgroup. So I will say that they have this level uh, gamma n. Now I'm also moving a little bit to higher generality because I defined uh, Jacobi forms uh, over, uh, over Q, let's say, uh, this time, or over uh, Z. This time, uh, but actually it is also possible to define them over totally real field. I didn't want to do this from the beginning just because uh, it's slightly more complicated, but it doesn't really matter that much uh, when we talk about the action of a Jacobi group. So we can really think of this as uh, the action of a certain congruence subgroup of Jacobi group whose entries are over totally real number field. And so when I'm writing, for example, OLN, I mean L by N matrices whose entries 
are in the ring of integers of f. Yes, in the similar case, uh, uh, everywhere else. So here you can see that there are many ideals coming out. There is fractional ideal B, there is uh, ideal E and C satisfying this relation at the end. And this is all, there are two reasons for that. One you will see at the very end. Uh, but this is also so that uh, the Jacobi forms that we consider are fairly general. So the results that we get apply to many Jacobi forms. And this is one of the reasons. But you don't really have to remember how this looks like. It's just it's that it depends on a few uh, ideals. But before we go farther, since you already he already seen how Eisenstein series uh, look like, I wanted to give you an example of an Eisenstein series defined on, on a Jacobi group, which is of Ziegel type. So we are in the domain of Jacobi forms, of course. And the Eisenstein series is defined in such a way. Again, you don't really have to remember this formula. This is just so that you can see uh, how this looks like. So here I'm consider an Eisenstein series, which is defined over group gamma. This is some congruent subgroup, can be the whole group G. In my case, it will be the congruent subgroup that I just showed you. And the summation is modeled out uh, by the parabolic subgroup of this group. The Eisenstein series is twisted uh, via character. And the parabolic su subgroup looks like follow as follows. So you already recognize this part. And this is the parabolic subgroup that we saw, I think, yesterday, subgroup of a symplectic group. And in the part uh, that comes for this triple, the Heisenberg part of a Jacobi group, uh, we have to take uh, this matrix uh, to be a zero matrix. Now, here is also uh, another part to notice. So I wrote in the definition uh, the subscript HN. And this is so that, because you see that I'm computing the terminant of the imaginary part. And normally, uh, well, this wouldn't be possible just for Z. So I'm restricting here to the variable that lives on HN. However, when we act by gamma, element of a Jacobi group, gamma sees that there is the, the Z. So then when you look how the action looks like, really uh, it matters that Z is on HN uh, uh, times uh, the matrix L by N matrices. Uh, so this is how Eisenstein series look like of Ziegel type. Uh, one can show that it is absolutely convergent in this range. And additionally, if F I S is equal to 0, it defines a holomorphic Jacobi form. Uh, but really, we wanted to compute an inner product of an Eisenstein series against the cusp form. But before we do that, we have to know how we embed uh, two smaller groups into bigger groups. And the choice that we make is important in a way that later we will have to find out double coset decomposition. And also we, have to have, we want to have a Jacobi form that is invariant by the congruence subgroup. So depending on the choice we make now, we can make our life easier or harder later. Uh, what we did, we embedded two Jacobi groups of different sizes to a bigger Jacobi group, as I told you. Uh, this bracket just means that I'm taking concatenation of two matrices. Uh, but you may prefer to view it uh, as a part of symplectic matrices. Uh, and then it looks as uh, follows. So in case of symplectic matrix, we kind of take a, I don't know, cross embedding, which looks like this. Here it's mainly concatenation of matrices. Uh, the idea of such embedding comes from Arakawa, actually. Uh, so now, mm, I, I will not tell you how one computes this inner product in practice. Actually, you don't really want to see how this looks like. Uh, the thing is that we 
the import, the, really the hard part of our work was, was to find out this uh, cost of decomposition that I mentioned. We had to model the Jacobi group over its parabolic subgroup on the other side by a product of two smaller Jacobi groups and also take into account uh, that this Eisenstein series is actually invariant under congruence subgroup. But then at the end, we managed to obtain uh, the following result. So F is a Jacobi form invariant by the congruence subgroup that we saw. It is a Hecke eigen form so that we can talk about the L function. Uh, Chi is a Hecke character uh, whose parity unfortunately matches the parity of the weight of Jacobi form. If you don't know what Hecke character is, you can just think of it as Dirichlet character and that Jacobi forms are over Q. And then we obtained the following equality. So we integrated the Eisenstein series that we you saw on the previous slide against the Jacobi cast form. And then what we got, we obtained a local uh, a pro uh, an Euler product of certain local L factors. And the remaining part uh, turned out to be a Jacobi Eisenstein series of clean hand type. I didn't define it here just because the definition is slightly more complicated. But perhaps you remember from yesterday that in the definition of Eisenstein series of clean hand type, we also use a modular form. So in this case, uh, the F that occurs there is a Jacobi form, which is very closely related to F uh, against which we integrate. And the local L factors are of the uh, following form. Uh, so perhaps you remember the remark of Professor Boscherer that when you consider modular forms invariant under congruence subgroup, uh, we don't have, one has to take care of bad places, uh, so to speak. So when we are away from the primes dividing the level, so C is like, say, the biggest ideal there, uh, then the local L factors really look like uh, the L function, the L factors for standard L function. And because of this, we call this L function a uh, standard L function. At the primes that divide a certain ideal E that occurred in the definition of this congruence subgroup, we don't get any contribution. Uh, why it is the case, I will uh, say a bit more uh, later. But at the primes that are kind of in the middle, uh, we obtain this, say, degenerate uh, product. And the result that I'm presenting here, uh, this formula, is really a generalization of the formula which was obtained uh, by Arakawa. Uh, our contribution is that we uh, included also twist by a character. Uh, we included Jacobi forms invariant by congruence subgroups. And also, we extended this to totally real uh, number fields. Uh, however, uh, when I'm presenting this theorem, I'm cheating a little bit. Because when you compute an inner product, you don't get uh, immediately the Euler product for the L functions. Sometimes you get, uh, but then because we were doing it more classically and not over Adels, say it was not that immediate maybe. So what we could do after we computed this inner product, we could separate uh, the part that belonged to Eisenstein series and the part which was supposed to belong uh, to the L function. Uh, but then in practice, uh, we define this L function uh, by a classical method using Hecke operators. I'm going to show you a little bit in a moment. And then checking what kind of L fact, um, and then checking basically of what we got from computing our inner product. Uh, we, were, we chose um, Hecke algebra according to which we defined our uh, L function. And then using completely different methods, uh, we proved separately uh, that it admits an Euler product. Uh, may I ask yes. you something? Um, maybe I give, since you congruences, uh, congruence suppose are chosen independently of, of your index, mm -hmm. 
So the Euler factors also do not, uh, you cannot, they do not uh, distinguish between uh, primes dividing the determinant of the index or something. Uh, so the index does not appear here at In all. a sense, yes. Uh, perhaps I should include it here. I will include it uh, in a moment when I will state the uh, when I will tell how we get this L function using Hecke operators. Actually, this assumption on the index should appear here since I'm already saying how uh, the okay. local L factors look like. Yeah, sorry, but yeah. this like just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, uh, so how can we define the L function using more classical methods? So we have our Jacobi forms and congruence subgroup, and we consider a Hecke algebra. Uh, which is generated by these matrices R that occur there. We have double coset decomposition, of course. And these R's are chosen in such a way <coughs> and that they have integral entries. Sorry. <coughs> I <coughs> Uh, yeah, so they have integral entries, um, but really the inverse is over integers only at the primes that divide this ideal E. So then, because of this, uh, there was no contribution at the primes dividing the ideal E. So now how we define Hecke operators? Uh, we take an integral ideal A, and then we consider all those R's whose determinant generates this ideal A. So we will have a few coset decompositions like this, uh, but then at the end, the action on Jacobi forms uh, is fairly classical, and well, we also have to take into account uh, uh, the character that occurs in the definition of a Jacobi form. So we assume that our Jacobi form is an eigenform, of these Hecke operators. And we will be twisting the, by car Hecke character chi. We define the, uh, we define the, prod, uh, the series as follows. So it is a sum over integral ideals, twisted by the character, the eigenvalues of f, and over the norm of integral ideal to the power s. Uh, so in a fairly standard way. And one can show that this series absolutely convergent converges in the range that is showed. So now it turns out that such defined series, if it is completed, it admits an Euler product. So we have a Jacobi form, which is a Hecke eigen form. And now here comes certain assumption on the index uh, that uh, yeah, the in, on the index of this Jacobi form that I don't, didn't really want to define here. And uh, <coughs> if we twist the series uh, by the product uh, of L factors, which really depend only on the uh, character chi, and we choose them depending whether the size of our index is odd or even, uh, then we get uh, local L factors that you have already seen. Uh, but then, as you pointed out, uh, the problem, I need to put certain assumption uh, uh, on the index. Uh, and it seems that it's not so easy at the moment to go around this, but it would be uh, really nice, of course. So if the index is a number, no. Well, he, here index is the matrix. Yes, but it could also be a number. Of course, yeah. of course. What is then the technical assumption um, on, uh, on this number? I mean, what assumption do you put on this index? Uh, uh, you yes. Have some technical assumption? Yes, I don't remember precisely. It's something like... Uh, when you consider this as a quadratic uh, form, then what you get at the end cannot be divisible by certain primes. Uh, I don't. I can check this later. Yeah, because yes. I remember that in Murasa Sugano, this condition was rather strong. 
still have the same uh, technical assumption? Uh, it is still the same, it's unfortunately. Same. Yes, yes. Okay, then I am aware. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, okay. Uh, so, uh, since this L function uh, comes from completed series that I just showed you, we know where it converges, absolutely. So, we can also say uh, we also know where our L function converges. And because it satisfies, uh, it admits an Euler product, then we can also say that at the air range of this S, uh, it does not uh, vanish. Mm, so now this is just the same theorem that you have already seen, uh, but I want to tell you why is this formula uh, useful? <coughs> because, okay, it looks quite nice, it involves some uh, L function, uh, yes, in, it involves different Eisenstein series, but what can we do with this? Well, as I told you, uh, we could use the information of Eisenstein series uh, to derive some analytic properties of our L function. Uh, here it may be not that clear because we have the variable S in many places, but then if you would take M equal to be equal to N, then the Klinghan Eisenstein series that occurs uh, on the right hand side uh, really would be just equal to a Jacobi form that comes into its definition and so on the right hand side we would just have uh, the L function times Jacobi form so in this case um, if we knew that the Eisenstein series on the left hand side admits meromorphic continuation uh, if we knew information about its poles uh, then we would be able to say, to say basically the same things about the L function. There is only one problem, uh, namely that it's, there is not so much known about Eisenstein series uh, defined on a Jacobi group uh, of Ziegel type or of Klinghen type, really. So at the moment, we cannot yet derive any information for the L function. But assume that we can do this, assume this for a moment, and then, if we had that, if we had analytic properties of the L function, then using this theorem in its full power, we could embed Jacobi groups of any sizes we wanted into this bigger Jacobi group. And then, having the analytic properties of, on everything but this clean hand type Eisenstein series that occurs on the right, we could derive. Um, its meromorphic continuation, we would be able to say something about its poles. Uh, but let me tell you more about this problem related to Eisenstein series on Jacobi forms. So if, I don't know, if you got lost in the middle, uh, this is a good time to come back again because it will be a little bit of history. Uh, I'm, I will just mention papers uh, which are relevant to for results that I'm going to discuss here. Uh, so the paper that was quite important for us uh, was paper of Shimura. He used a doubling method for Eisenstein series defined over the symplectic group. And from this, he was able to derive an information on meromorphic continuation on the poles of the standard L function attached to Ziegel modular forms uh, that has this level. This congruence subgroup that occurs here is really the same congruence subgroup that we use on its symplectic part, of course. Yes, we also have this uh, extra part that comes from a Jacobi group. And actually, this paper uh, was an inspiration for the methods that we used. In a sense, we translated the results of Shimura to the Jacobi setting. Uh, but what Shimura did, he first proved meromorphic continuation of the Eisenstein series, information about the poles, and then derive them to, to the L function. Uh, but actually, uh, the first person who was able to say something about uh, L function associated to a Jacobi form uh, was Muraja. He also used the doubling method, but his idea was different. Our is more modeled on the um, on the method of Garrett. He used really Piatecki, Shapiro, and Rallis approach. So he embedded to the same Jacobi groups uh, 
but into a symplectic group. And so because of this, he already knew the information on Eisenstein series defined over symplectic group, and then could push them further to get the information on the L function uh, to get this, uh, its meromorphic continuation for the L function associated to Jacobi forms of higher index. But then they were, the Jacobi forms were just invariant by the full uh, Jacobi group. Now, the first person who considered an Eisenstein series defined over Jacobi group, but in this case, this is the simplest Jacobi group where the, the triples are just uh, numbers and the symplectic parts are four by four matrices. Uh, was Sugano. Uh, so then he also used uh, a doubling method, prove the information, uh, if I'm not mistaken, analomorphic continuation for the Eisenstein series, and then push this information further uh, to L functions associated to Jacobi forms. Uh, but then here we have only the simplest case of Jacobi forms, uh, where index is just a number and also yeah, just of the simplest Jacobi forms. And the Jacobi form is of the invariant by the full group. And only over 10, uh, ten years later, uh, Heim considered Eisenstein series defined over uh, Jacobi groups of higher indices, and actually basing on the idea of Boscher for Eisenstein series over symplectic groups, he proved meromorphic continuation and found possible poles for this Eisenstein series. However, still there was no mention of a congruence subgroup. And uh, together with Thanasis, uh, we managed to extend the idea of Heim <coughs> to prove meromorphic continuation and find possible poles uh, for our Eisenstein series. Uh, having invariant by this congruence subgroup. And as I told you, after that, uh, we could derive this information also for the standard L function uh, that we just constructed. Uh, and the basic idea behind, behind this approach is as follows. Um, so you, you take your Eisenstein series, defined over a Jacobi group, and then you write it as a finite sum of products. One part in the product uh, takes care of the, say, Jacobi part and uh, does not depend on the variable S at all. The other parts are summons in the classical Eisenstein series, which is defined over a symplectic group. So after we wrote down our Jacobi Eisenstein series uh, as a finite sum of these summons times the part that doesn't really matter, uh, we were able to extract the information on the Eisenstein series defined on the symplectic group, get the information about this summons, and then interpret it for our whole Jacobi Eisenstein series. So this is the uh, main idea. Uh, but before I finish, I would like to give you yet uh, another application of the doubling method uh, that you have seen. So we already saw it's useful uh, to say something about analytic properties of the L function. Uh, you can construct an L function in this way. Uh, but then you can also uh, use it to be able to say about something about algebraic, uh, algebraicity of special values of the L function. However, here the important part is that first of all, this all has to make sense, yes? So first, thanks to Shimura, uh, we know that it makes sense to consider Jacobi forms with algebraic uh, Fourier coefficients. Mm, so we can pick the basis of Jacobi forms, which has these algebraic Fourier coefficients. And therefore, uh, we can try to see uh, whether, uh, whether special values of the L functions are algebraic or not. So this is something what you would, in general, expect to the L functions. Uh, that are associated to automorphic forms uh, invariant by reductive groups just because they are related uh, to geometric objects. Uh, Jacobi group, which we considered here, is, uh, is like a classical case of a non-reductive group. And because of this, it does not re it's not really related um, 
so easily to a geometric object. Uh, it's, relaxed, it's related to something that is called mixed Shimura uh, uh, variety. But then because of this, it was not quite clear whether you could expect some nice informations about the algebraic properties of the L function. However, uh, it turns out that uh, actually uh, you can prove something. Uh, so if we denote by lambda the completed L function that we defined, uh, then we are able to prove uh, the following. Uh, our base field can be either total real number field or Q. In case of Q, n has to be greater than 1 for uh, uh, holomorphicity reason, but this can be also uh, weakened. K is a Hecke character whose parity, again, matches the parity of the weight of the Jacobi form. We consider eigenfunction of Hecke operators with algebraic uh, Fourier coefficients. And then under certain assumptions on K, uh, just because of the convergence, and certain property P, which I don't mention here, uh, just because it's a little bit uh, involved and it's best seen when you see how the proof looks like. We can see we can prove that this quotient, so the L completed L function uh, divided by a, by an explicit power of pi and divided by Peterson inner product of f actually has, an algeb has algebraic values at all these points uh, where the Eisenstein series of Ziegel type that you have seen uh, is so-called uh, nearly holomorphic. Now, I should just so that you know that this theorem happens at some place, and uh, this property P, which I didn't really mention here, uh, holds, for example, uh, when F has uh, class number one, when we just consider the full Jacobi group, or f is of so-called uh, non-parallel weight. Uh, so this is what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Jacobi forms, uh, you can always um, expand into theta expansion, where you have as coefficients modular forms of some uh, smaller weight. And, uh, or you can identify a Jacobi form with something people call vector valued modular form. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I'm always not sure um, to which extent the theory of Jacobi forms and in this setting which you use mm -hmm. is uh, something that ca could be completely uh, be done in the, in the setting of these uh, vector valued modular forms. Mm. Uh, Yes. Uh, Instead of using the, so whether this is just a change of language or is there something new intrinsically in the setting of Jacobi forms? This I, mm -hmm. I am never sure about. Okay. I, I yes, but I don't know. Is it possible to write every Jacobi form, like invariant by different congruence subgroup and of higher indices also yeah, in terms of? Such a, um, a vector of, uh, Forms. This is one to one. Yeah? Uh, so, in the case of where the index is a number, you would get modular forms of half integral weight. Yeah? Uh, but I, I don't know. As I say, I, I, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Nobody has done this really. Uh, um, I'm always suspicious that this uh, uh, condition on the, on the index is such is so strong that it assures this one to one uh, translation from one setting into the other. I see. Uh, and yes. So 
but I, this is only some suspicion. I do not uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. insist on this. Mm. Yeah, so, well, in any case, these results are new, even though, even if there was this one-to-one -one correspondence. I, I hope in this case, this is not the case, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, uh, but actually, one would have to study more precisely this, exactly this condition yeah, on the work, but one side you index. Have to work, of course. You don't yes. get it for free. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but I'm not sure whether this is just a choice of language in which of these two settings you really work. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so one would have more. to study the index, of course, more precisely. If it would happen that this is the same, then it's, uh, in a sense, good for mathematical community, I would say. Um, the other thing is that sometimes Jacobi forms turn out to be more useful than the modular forms. So <laughs> depend on what you have to use. Actually, uh, Professor Dombrowski asked me for something like this, um, but to be honest, I'm not an expert on this. I, uh, if somebody would plan, then maybe uh, Thanasis, because we, he worked with periodic objects. Uh, myself, I don't feel yet uh, uh, able to do this, but. <laughs> then the question is whether it would yeah, be really and interesting. And, uh, <laughs> My answer, <laughs> the answer is very simple. Uh, um, if we know enough about the arithmetic structure of the Fourier expansion of the Jacobi Eisenstein series, then probably we can do it. But I don't know to which extent this has been worked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to know enough about the uh, Fourier expansion of the these. Uh, Jacobi Eisenstein series. Yeah. Yes. Then one can do something. Okay. But I needed ten years to do it for the <laughs> case. <laughs> Maybe after ten years I will be able to do this. Uh, yes. Oh, but other things that really should be done is, as we discussed. Uh, this assumption on the index that occurred before, and actually what really annoys us uh, is this assumption on the parity of the character. So here it does have to, has too much uh, the weight of the Jacobi form that we are using. And the, just the reason is that, uh, well, otherwise uh, our equality will not give any meaningful. And then to be able to use this doubling method, we would have to shift the weight of the Eisenstein series that we get. And, but then to do this, we would have to introduce differential operators on Jacobi forms. And at the moment, we tried a few ideas. It seems a bit computations are absolutely horrible. And at the moment, we don't know how, but we still have some ideas to try. So maybe in the future. And then also, well, this property P that I. You see, there exists also periodic theory, which is developed by Kerzhoi in his PhD thesis in 91. So you could conduct him. But that was mm -hmm. in the simplest case, not for the more general group, but for the elliptical. But to say, I said, in, in the style of um, the book of I feel like Yeah, but still that can be easily uh, uh, translated into the setting of these Theta extensions. Yes, yes. So it is. So it could be very useful. He works in Padal Lumen. That's nice. And he has a several of his students like so Grand Student Mathematics. And he is still interested in this. Yes, well, it could be a good starting point to look at his work yes, also. You so you know that he worked a lot of he went to Mankai for two years maybe under Minero Foundation. Uh, so it would be of interest to develop this type. And Andrzej Dombrowski, of course, he came recently. And do you have 
some material also compound your work? Uh, not, a, not at the moment. Explain material can be some function of the material. Yes, but it would be interesting to show that this uh, function is associated uh, to some kind of motivical function because then it would have some uh, consequences, yes, on the periods. So another remark I would like to so to end is about using the doubling method for simulative functions by Eichen. You know Eichen. Yes. Eichen. He's very active in, in, in this field. Maybe uh, we have some project also to attach kind of nativity functions and families also, families, uh, for such kind of, for simulative function using the doubling method. Would be of interest. Mm -hmm. But she is also using some, how to say, a lot of uh, work of other mathematicians, women, you know. Okay. They wrote some uh, article of five women, maybe it was. I was surprised. Karayani, maybe Anna, you know. I see. No, I haven't met. Elena, Eichen, they were all around the unitary group. Unitary group and the women. Interesting. But perhaps it was the effect of the conference Women in Numbers, which is actually a, a good idea to join women yeah, together yeah, so yeah, that yeah. they can work on different so topics. You, can, you find that this article easily in the web of five authors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Anna uh, Karayani, she spoke last year in Marx Planck on this subject, so it is related maybe to the coming mathematical progress. So please look at this also work. Anna Karayani and uh, Eileen Eichen, there are five authors. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So there was some other name. I forgot the name. It's very useful. Doubling method is a very general idea. But for me, doubling method originates in Becker's work. <laughs> yes, you perhaps I should say, because you I did it independently, uh, uh, right? For simplicity. Uh, several ways to tell history. <laughs> you started with Petrovsky Shapiro and Rennes, but I think. I should start with Garrett. Due to Garrett. Mm -hmm. And by the way, his paper was traveling around to several journals it and nobody, nobody wanted to accept it yes. because it seemed to be strange. It was uh, something completely new and people refused to publish it. Interesting. Over several years. And uh, uh, I think the first credit has to be given to Garrett and Petit Shapir and Ernest. They developed this in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a more fashionable setting, but uh, okay, yes. Uh, but there's, there's many ways to tell history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think it's interesting to know that this paper of Garrett was not accepted by many yes, journals exactly. because this was something new and people did not um, appreciate uh, yeah. what he was <laughs> doing. Um, yeah. New things are difficult to accept. Yeah. Yes. Well, if yes, something yes. simplifies, considerably, but <laughs> also people think annoyed. Yes, but after that, he received a lot of credit for his work, yes. of course. Uh, <laughs> I think not enough. enough. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. But yes. you, your work was uh, in 83, yeah, published. Uh, and uh, yeah. it was called. So, no. Yeah, yeah, so I had three papers uh, so in between 83 and 85. No, I mean the first time. Which one? Uh-huh. Three. 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 Yeah. Because also Petersky Shakir and Ralitz worked when he was in Princeton for the first time. And they did not also publish it immediately. It was maybe in 76 uh, it was published. Mm -hmm. 
Durham conference. Durham conference. It was something was also announced there in Durham. There was a famous conference in Italy where also Conan and Zagir wrote an important contribution about the Peterson project. And also this was exposed by Ralich, and he was there. But a complete text appeared in lecture notes after some years. And also God appeared to find a result. But me, I learned it from Zikrin's paper first <laughs> in German. In Moscow, I am referring to a journal. Which is ah, I papers. Was very inspiring because then we organized also a conference with Professor Kuzminsov in the river Amu, which happened exactly 30 years ago. You see, it was very important because Rankin came there, the gear, and many other people. But not the one more because he shall be with the which was quite useful. But that was important to discuss. The Pierre Zikert gave a brilliant book collection. Skarupa, Conan, yeah. So it was much developing in that period, yeah. But now maybe you have another stage to we'll revitalize it together with Ellen Isaac, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yes, so please. She but will give, give a lecture in Osaka. <coughs> Mm. But Asian's case is uh, unitary groups. Unitary, yeah. So yeah. I feel very really similar to the book. Mm. They, well, they both correspond to similar varieties. And excuse me, I still have some another third maybe remark. It's about the geometric interpretation of this uh, Jacobi forms because Usually, usual modular forms, as explained by Serbe, functions on elliptic curves. Yeah? But Jacobi forms also you can interpret as a functions on pairs, so elliptic curves and the point on it. Yeah? And there is um, somebody in Germany developing this method for the many dimensional forms. Kramer? Kramer. <coughs> It, it could be useful also for the proving congruences because it's practically it's a method of cuts. So it's uh, also it's uh, worthwhile to keep in mind that you have a geometric interpretation of this theory. Thank you. I hope it will work also. That I asked actually already to Gerzoi, but he did not do it. It's too complicated for him to And he did very explicit work. How to say? Classically. It was his PhD.